Howdy, 2022 gamers! So, over the course of 2021, I played a lot of games. Well, that could be said for most years, honestly, but... I feel like there was a decent quantity of games that came out that appealed to me personally over uh, the last year. Maybe not as much as 2020, because, to be honest, that year was pretty damn crazy, especially in terms of... Uh, JRPGs, which I would consider my personal staple genre, but there, there was still a steady flow of solid releases this year. I will say that there's a pretty big chasm between the number one and number two pick on this top ten list. Probably not hard to imagine what that might be specifically. Uh, but before I get into the top ten proper, I would like to list off a few honorable mentions. I, I know these usually go at the end, but it Makes more sense to put them before the list here, I guess. Uh, so the first honorable mention will be WarioWare Get It Together for the Nintendo Switch. I used to really love the WarioWare series back in the day. Uh, WarioWare Touched was my first Nintendo DS game and I played it pretty obsessively. The newest game on the Switch is really good. I would say it's the best WarioWare game overall like from a, a kind of objective standpoint, but I can't really help but feel that in a way I've sort of outgrown WarioWare. It, it's definitely a fun game, but I couldn't really get into it like I used to. It probably would have helped if I had friends to play the multiplayer with, because a lot of the game is kind of uh, focused around those multiplayer modes, but unfortunately none of my friend group is really into casual party games, so that was kind of a no-go on that front. Uh, the second honorable mention is Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl. So with Super Smash Bros. Ultimate wrapping up its post-launch content this year, there was a ever-so-alluring spot open on the market for a new platform fighter to fill the void. Nick All-Stars was shaping up to be a pretty exciting prospect. The gameplay was fast and fun, and the roster had lovable and iconic characters that appealed to the inner nostalgia boomer in all of us. The devs were very active in the online community spaces and did a great job of hyping up the game, making it obvious that they were passionate about their work. But uh, there were too many things holding the game back from greatness in the end, I think. There was some signs of red tape from Nickelodeon that seemed uh, pretty evident, possibly with the game being rushed out, as hinted by characters and other assets being found in the game files to be saved for, thankfully, free DLC later down the line. The online feature worked well enough thanks to everyone's favorite netcode system, but matchmaking and lobby still managed to be a point of pain, uh, especially on release. And of course there was a general lack of polish and content that kind of led to the hype fizzling out quickly after launch. That being said, the game is kind of on track to be further supported and polished throughout 2022, and it could very well shape up to be a suitable platform fighter to maybe not rival Smash Bros, but be a fun and niche side game on its own, right? And, and who knows, they might even finally get character voice acting, that, that could be cool. Anyways, let's get right on into the top 10 list now. So, starting off the list at number 10, we have Pokemon Brilliant Diamond. So, I really wanted to dislike this game just kind of out of principle, and in many ways there's still a lot of things I do dislike about it. So it's a recreation of Diamond and Pearl that's faithful to a fault, I would argue, and the chibi art style that attempts to capture the feel of the original overworld sprites. It was, while not as universally disliked as I thought it might have been, uh, I still personally would have preferred something more akin to Sword and Shield or Let's Go in terms of aesthetics. But really the main issue is just that they didn't do enough to add on to the originals. Heart Gold and Soul Silver were well beloved, not just for being remakes of Gold and Silver, but by padding it out with new content mixed in with the old. It really does feel like a pretty big missed opportunity for the Sinnoh region. 
Now with all that being said, the Pokemon formula and gameplay loop is, well, pretty much sacred. Ultimately, it's impossible to screw up catching and battling Pokemon, so... Yes, the game was somewhat underwhelming and disappointing, but even still, I can't deny that I had a good time on this glorified nostalgia trip. And being a better version of Pokemon Diamond isn't necessarily a bad thing either. It's definitely an improvement being on an HD system with 3D animated graphics and fixing some of the glaring issues that the game suffered, namely the glacial pacing of traversing through the overworld, cutting out HMs, putting Bidoof out of a job, and fixing the bizarre encounter table somewhat through the reworked underground zones. Of course, a lot of this stuff was already improved through Platinum, which this game doesn't really acknowledge in any way, but it's, it's got to count for something. Anyways, if you're looking to re-experience Sinnoh after like 15 years, or experience it for the first time, uh, this is probably the definitive way to go now. I mean, with how Pokemon games are, I wouldn't be surprised if a used copy of Pokemon Diamond for the DS went for just as much, if not more, than a brand new copy of Brilliant Diamond. Next up at number 9 is going to be Guilty Gear Strive. So my history with fighting games has been somewhat of a storied one. My first fighting game I really played was Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 back on the Xbox 360 and it was pretty much love at first sight. Ever since then I've been chasing that same high, fruitlessly jumping between fighting games just trying to feel something again. Well, dramatics aside, uh, Guilty Gear Strive is a pretty solid fighting game. It handles really well and seems to shed away a lot of the arbitrary barrier to entry level difficulty, albeit somewhat reluctantly because anime fighting game players do love their execution barriers. That's not really meant to be a jab at them, there is a lot of merit in having a game be tough as nails for sure, but the easier to pick up and still difficult to master approach that the game seems to have adopted makes it more appealing for me personally. I'm not the most knowledgeable when it comes to fighting games so forgive me if I have to step around the proverbial eggshells in an attempt to stay in my lane so to speak. It wasn't necessarily a game I stuck with for the long term but I did get a decent amount of mileage out of it at launch especially. It was fun running over people with Mr. Dolphin, and the visuals and music were pretty enjoyable. Uh, unfortunately, the friends that I did play the game with got way more into it than I did to the point where it wasn't really fun to play against them, and I didn't really feel like grinding the ladder solo, so that's kind of where my run with Guilty Gear Strive ended. Now if only they added rollback to Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, that game was a bit more my speed, I would say. Okay, so, number 8 is going to be Ruined King. Uh, I've always been a fan of Riot's lore for League of Legends, way back from the Burning Tides event, and maybe even before then. Of course, now with the smash success of the Netflix series Arcane, it doesn't really have to be a guilty pleasure anymore to say that I'm a lore nerd for League of Legends. So The Ruined King is Riot's first game through the Riot Forge program, a way for them to collaborate with indie developers to license games based on the League of Legends universe. The story follows a group of champions from League as they embark on a quest to stop Viego, the Ruined King. The gameplay is taken straight from developer Airship Syndicate's other game, Battle Chasers, being a turn-based RPG with a unique speed lane system that lets you power up your moves or power them down, which would decrease or increase the cast delay of that move. It handled surprisingly well. I, I was a bit, I guess, intimidated by it at first, but I got used to it pretty quickly. Anyways, it was a real treat seeing these League characters that I've played with for hundreds if not thousands of hours over the years, pretty faithfully recreated in an entirely new genre. Credit to the developers, they really did their homework when translating over the characters from a MOBA to an RPG, with their movesets and items stuffed full of references to the source material, 
while also creating new moves that still fit the characters. The writing is where the game really shines, though. There's so much lore and world building for Runeterra in this game, with the characters being very well represented through their dialogue. Originally, The Ruin King was meant to release earlier in 2021, acting as somewhat of a prequel or a setup to the Ruination event held throughout Riot's own games. Well, not only did the Ruin King game get delayed until late 2021, the Ruination event ended up being somewhat of a flop story-wise, with even Riot admitting that they missed the mark on that one. Furthermore, the game itself was plagued with glitches on launch, particularly on the Switch version. I, I played the game on Switch and I encountered multiple game-breaking bugs, from textures breaking to significant frame drops, to even the game just straight up crashing. There was uh, one point in particular where the game would just crash 100% of the time at a certain zone, so I had no choice but to just wait for a patch to progress through the story. I'm not sure how stable the game is on console now, but I would heavily advise picking it up on PC if that's an option. Okay, so, number 7, Persona 5 Strikers. Uh, one of the coolest parts of the Persona 4 spin-offs during that game's reign of terror was that they were actually canon sequels to the ending of Persona 4. Persona 4 Dancing All Night and Persona 4 Arena and Ultimax followed Yu Narukami reuniting with his friends from the investigation team to go on further adventures. Honestly, I love that. I didn't care if they were milking the franchise, as some might have argued. It was just great being able to see these characters that I grew so attached to again. Persona 5 did have some spin-offs of its own, to the surprise of nobody thanks to its explosive popularity. However, up to this point, none of them really counted as canon or sequels to the ending of Persona 5. Dancing in Starlight was, disappointingly, just a dream sequence that occurred in the middle of Persona 5's main story, rather than after the ending. And Persona Q2 also followed a similar format. That all changed, of course, with Persona 5 Strikers, which took a notoriously long time to get localized, taking a full year between the Japanese and global release dates. Now, the gameplay for Strikers is not really too much to write home about. It's kind of a button mashy game, as you might expect from a Warriors style. But it does have some Persona 5 flair, adding on a bit of depth. With a Persona Fusion and Compendium system, and the elemental abilities and weaknesses you'd expect from the series. Overall, not terrible, but that's okay, because the main selling point is just to spend more time with the Phantom Thieves again. I mean, it really is quite telling when the best part of a Musuo game is when they actively avoid trying to make a Musuo game. Anyways, Strikers really nails the road trip with the homies vibe. A lot of fun bonding moments and slice of life episodes. Admittedly, at times it does feel like a bit of a watered down version of what they served in Persona 5 already, but getting more of the same is already pretty satisfying, I would argue. The story is pretty decent too. The new characters they added are surprisingly well done. Sophia is a fun addition, and then Kichi ended up being cool as well. It was refreshing having a competent adult as a Persona user on your side for a change. I know that's been done in the older Persona games, but we don't talk about those. That, that, that's the joke, right? I, I, the, the, the series started with three. <laughs> Funny. So the next two entries are both RPGs that I had a bit of a hard time settling on the order of. Both of them were enjoyable games, but did not really capture my heart like some of the RPGs last year did. Honestly, I feel like just having a decently highly produced traditional turn-based RPG with limited real-time action mechanics is already going to be winning a lot of points for me, as low of a bar as that might sound. I definitely don't want to say that it's a dying genre quite yet, but there are times where it feels like there's somewhat of a push to phase it out, if you know what I mean. Uh, that tangent aside though, uh, this spot on the list will go to Bravely Default 2. This was actually my first experience with the Bravely Default series, and I found it to be a really solid RPG. 
I don't think there was any point in the game that really blew me away since it did feel very by the book in terms of mechanics and story. But that's perfectly fine as well. There is there is merit in the level of unabashed simplicity it achieves. Well, uh, calling it that might be underselling the game a bit. There were some aspects that I thought were quite neat overall. Mainly the job system that this series is allegedly famous for. It was really fun mixing and matching jobs and skills to create synergistic movesets and team compositions. And of course the game itself offered a pretty satisfying level of challenge I would say. A lot of uh, RPGs where you have that level of freedom tend to struggle with giving you too much power, but I thought the balance was pretty well done overall. Okay, so entry number 5 is going to be, fittingly enough, Shin Megami Tensei 5, and I thought it was just ever so slightly better than the last entry. Perhaps it might be a bit of recency bias, and there are certain aspects that both games do better than the other, but... Well, you can't really compare them, actually. They're both turn-based RPGs, and that's about it. <laughs> Regardless, I really did enjoy SMT5, and it does deserve a spot on this list. My history with the SMT series is admittedly not very long. I played SMT4 a few years back on the 3DS, but for various reasons I couldn't really get into it. Chiefly among them probably being that I just didn't really feel like playing games on a 3DS anymore at that point. This was after the Switch had launched, put into context. Uh, that being said, I was totally willing to give the series another shot, so SMT5 seemed like the perfect chance to jump right in. And I am glad that I did. The RPG battle mechanics felt like they were fine-tuned to perfection, and it was a lot of fun collecting demons and customizing my team. Constantly fusing and replacing my demons to create an optimal composition felt felt like a lot more in-depth version of how I like to play Pokemon sometimes. Now, the area where I feel the game did falter somewhat was the storytelling and dialogue, a common area of criticism as I've found. I really wanted to like the story since the plot threads and story beats were actually quite intriguing with how they were set up, but the payoff just wasn't really there and a lot of the plot relevant characters felt kind of bland. On top of that, I am usually just not a huge fan of apocalyptic settings or grim atmospheres in general. That's more of a personal thing though, I, I know the atmosphere is a huge selling point for many people, but... Honestly, I, I do kind of prefer the cheesy power of friendship and anime that you get with Persona, as superficial as that might be. Anyways, I feel like a statement like that just isn't really kosher, but I will say that I do think SMT had a more fun and exciting combat gameplay. It was a little frustrating at times, admittedly, dying to the enemy getting eight turns in a row, but it never got to the point where I felt it was super unfair. Just a little tedious having to constantly go back to the save point, just to be on the safe side. Honestly, if they had a Persona game with SMT style gameplay, or at least closer to that level of difficulty, I, I feel like that would be kind of a sweet spot for me. Okay, so number four, we have Pokemon Unite. Pokemon Unite is a great example of a game that I never knew that I wanted. Uh, Pokemon has dipped into a number of genres, being the multimedia giant that it is, but I never really expected MOBA to be one of them. When it was first announced and it seemed like the whole world was against the idea, I couldn't help but be excited, or at least intrigued by the prospect. So the game launched to a surprisingly explosive popularity before quickly fizzling down and suffered no shortage of controversies along the way. I, I would argue a lot of it was kind of undeserved bad rep at the start, like the allegations of being pay to win, which I would say might have been a bit of a stretch. I won't argue that the monetization is pretty steep, especially when it comes to the cosmetic items, since some of them are a little pricey. A lot pricey, actually. <laughs> But as far as the in-game battle items go, the progression never really stood out as much worse than any other MOBA that I've played. 
Well, the game is fun. It's fast, with each match only lasting up to 10 minutes, and and despite it being pretty simple, there is a decent amount of area for skill expression. I thought playing a MOBA on a controller or on a phone would be awkward after playing League with mouse and keyboard for so long, but it handled surprisingly well, I would say. And the developers seem to put effort into balancing the game competently and providing a steady pipeline of updates, which is more than I or a lot of other people were expecting from this kind of game. It really does seem like a lot of love is shown for the Pokemon franchise with Unite. They draw from a relatively diverse pool of Pokemon, and while they do have the obvious picks that you see in every spin-off like Pikachu, Gengar, Greninja, Lucario, and such, there's plenty of niche picks as well like Eldegost and Crustle that have almost certainly become immensely more popular solely thanks to their role in Pokemon Unite. And a lot of the characters are represented quite well in how they play. I really have to give props for translating the Pokemon and their RPG movesets into a more action-based MOBA game. It's quite satisfying being an immovable wall with Snorlax or firing off devastating Hyper Beams as Dragonite, which correlate well to their respective appearances in the main series Pokemon games. So coming in at the prestigious number 3 slot is Monster Hunter Rise for the Nintendo Switch and I guess PC now. So Monster Hunter is a very much beloved series and while I'm not much of a Monster Hunter veteran myself, I did enjoy Rise a lot. <laughs> I'm starting to notice a bit of a trend with some of these games that release for Switch. Anyways, I did play World a bit as well, so I'm not completely novice with the series, and a lot of that experience did transfer over to Rise. Thanks to the added mobility from the wire bugs and less emphasis on scouting and tracking the monsters, I do think I enjoyed Rise significantly more than World. Really though, I feel that with Monster Hunter they just have a winning formula. So even though there's a semblance of a new storyline, just putting in new areas with new monsters and some returning ones with souped up kits to fight is already going to be a solid game on its own. The new hub world, while a bit simple, was quite nice as well, aesthetically and thematically. Even if I did prefer the comically excessive meat feasts from World over the dango and tea that they serve in Rise. That said, while I did enjoy my time with Monster Hunter Rise and I played it a lot on launch, I do feel like I've gotten my fill and I'm not really sure how compelled I will be to get the DLC expansion pack when that comes out. Monster Hunter does feel a bit harder to just pick up and play and I'm not sure how much I can rely on muscle memory for coming back to some of the harder fights. Next up at number 2 we have Ace Attorney Chronicles. Not really sure if this counts as two games or one, but I'm counting it as one. So Ace Attorney Chronicles was a game that I had resigned myself to never being able to play. I know that there were fan translation patches, but I kind of just wrote it off as that weird Japan-only spin-off game that I didn't really feel a burning need to look into further. Uh, don't get me wrong, I do respect the hell out of fan translation efforts, but a lot of them tend to be very literal with translations, causing the end result to come out kind of dry and flat at times. I, I do recognize that it's the most optimal way for a fan translation to operate, since localization is a very different set of skills that is not entirely necessary for those kinds of projects. Well anyways, when it was announced to actually being officially localized, I figured I might as well play it since it's probably the last Ace Attorney content we'll be getting for a long time. I, I also suppose it might be too soon to write off this series as dead dead, but it's been years with no announcement in sight for an Ace Attorney 7 and Capcom's priorities seem to be very clearly elsewhere currently. I do know that there were some leaks and various mentions of it, but I'm not holding my breath for an Ace Attorney 7 anytime soon still. 
Anyways, Chronicles managed to stand out on its own as some of the best the Ace Attorney series has to offer. I would say even better than the main series games. The jury system is very well implemented and a fun mechanic overall, and, and the trials themselves are mostly pretty memorable and have well-written dialogue with no obvious dud chapters like some of the mainline games tend to have. It, it is hard to say if there's a future for Ryunosuke, but... If they do end up making an Ace Attorney 7, I would at least like to see some of the system modernizations they added to Chronicles make it in. And of course, the number one spot couldn't go to anything else but Final Fantasy XIV Online and Walker. Yes, an expansion is the best game of the year. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It is just that good. It is an extremely rare instance for me when a game transcends being a game and becomes somewhat of a life experience, but I would say that is what I got with my decision to pick up Final Fantasy XIV earlier this year. Funnily enough, what kind of nudged me into playing it was that silly Butterfingers promotional campaign to get an in-game mount if you bought Butterfingers candy. At that point in my life, I wasn't playing the game, even though I had an account in one of the beginner areas that I played for a few hours. And I had never eaten a Butterfingers in my life, so it sounds kind of silly in hindsight, but it was an amusing notion at the time. It also helps that this was around the time that the trailers and news for Endwalker started dropping, so my friends who did play were on the hype train, and you know about how dedicated 14 players are about converting others to their cause. Through this game, I've made new friends. I got to be even closer with some of the friends I already had, so really it was a win-win situation, I would say. So yeah, this game really is something special. Easily my favorite expansion for Final Fantasy XIV and one of my favorite video game storylines in general. Of course, more than the story, I'm interested in the raiding scene, for which the first Savage raids have yet to drop as of the time of this video, so I can't wait for that. It'll be my first experience with new raid content as it drops, so I have no idea what I'm really in for. And while it's true that the queue issues and connection errors did put somewhat of a damper on the overall launch experience, I didn't seem to struggle with it as much as other people might have. Yeah, during the first few weeks after launch, there were 5,000 plus people queues that took hours to wait through, but I gotta commend the devs for making the experience, once you actually get into the game, be completely smooth. I was expecting more lag or game-breaking bugs, as some MMO veterans have spoken of for expansion patch day horror stories. But no, the experience was relatively flawless, after the queue, of course. I only hope that they start letting people buy the game again soon. It seems that only once it becomes unavailable do some people really start wanting to play the game for real. Uh, anyways, that's my list for 2021 games. I have a lot that I'm looking forward to. I would say 2021 was kind of a bridge year. I think that is actually also somewhat what inspired my decision to pick up Final Fantasy XIV as in kind of a transitional year between the great games from 2020 and the big launches that I'm looking forward to. Anyways, if you have your own thoughts or opinions, feel free to leave a comment. I would love to see what you think of my absolutely horrible by pretty much any objective metric taste in games from this year. <laughs> to be honest, I, I, I know what I'm about, but... Anyways, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. See you in the next one.